Today is Mother's Day, and in commemoration of that, we're turning to the Old Covenant Scripture of 1 Samuel, and the mother's gift, and the call of Samuel. Mother's Day calls to mind many memories of childhood and, and those terrible twos and the days of joys, and sometimes the disciplines leading to ever, ever to the adult world. And that's when it really begins. It really begins to begin to make sense. I was 16 when I saw fully why the discipline had been necessary. Praise the Lord for it, for it's no telling what might have happened if I had been one of those homes that there had not been discipline, rules and regulations that you had to adhere to and suffer the consequences when you didn't. But I began to see my parents in even a greater light then and love them even all the more. And that's when we really get to appreciate, to appreciate our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents and, and all of those who have any authority over us like teachers and, and, and policemen and things of that sort. Yes, we do appreciate our parents, and especially our mother's many interventions in our lives and her many sacrifices to us and her family. And what memories we have of our mothers. Some still with us and some of ours have gone on ahead. But they've paved a good road for us to follow, if we will. Sometimes even leading children to a saving relationship with God through the Messiah. Savior. I remember my first prayer. I think I was about three or so, and now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord. Well, if I, now I lay me down to sleep, and if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I didn't understand what the words meant at that time, but I learned later on. But that stayed with me, and when I think of my mother, sometimes that pops back into my head, and I kind of got a little bit of picture of what I must have looked like, and so I'll go look at a picture, and I can see what I looked like at that time, and with my head too big for my body and things like that, you know, and the kind of funny ways that we do in growing up and changing over time. My mother and my grandparents first introduced me to the Lord Jesus Christ. All through my childhood, I learned about Jesus. But my first call was in my sixth grade. I think I told you, did I ever mention to you my dream? Wasn't really a dream, actually. It was, an in, it was a visitation. I was in my bed in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and all of a sudden, this ecstatic emotion came over me and it got so great and undescribable. And finally I said, stop. And it went away. But I had been under some conviction. We had gone back to Greensboro and when we went to Greensboro, I went back to the Salvation Army where my granddad and my grandmother were Salvation Army ministers. And uh, he was also the jail sergeant for 20 years, jail sergeant major, uh, handling all of the ministries, several each Sunday afternoon throughout city jail. And I had been under conviction Later on, I learned what that was. Looking back, I can see that God was getting my attention. However, I did not fully accept him until later on at the age of 80, uh, the age of 21. <laughs> I keep thinking about how old I am now. <laughs> anyway, at, and 
I had already mentioned to you about Youth for Christ and, and about uh, uh, being called to the ministry after that experience. But see, I thought I was okay through all those years because I knew so much about Jesus. And I had just assumed since I knew so much, I must be okay. But I, I still found that I could not always not sin. And even when I tried to stop, I, I wasn't very good at that either. Well, today is Mother's Day, and, and as we celebrate that special day to remember our mothers and, and the contributions they made to our lives and to our nation too, by the way, especially our nation in the early days, we remember back to those things that, that happen in our lives. And so it brings to mind today the prophet Samuel's miracle birth and the special call that he received and recorded in his book in the Old Testament or Old Covenant scriptures by his name, 1 Samuel. But first we have to begin at the beginning. Samuel had been had to be born, then he had to grow up, and he had to be trained to become God's servant, prophet, and the leader among his people Israel, and the found, founder of the school of the prophets that is still in vogue today in Israel. And so we begin in his book by his name. We begin in his birth and later in his call. So all people must sometimes or other in their life receive God's call. And they will. Everyone will have an opportunity. They'll feel the conviction of sin and then either surrender to the Lord or decide to turn away. But real life begins right there at first time under conviction. And when it's appropriately surrendered to, it lasts forever. God's call and gifts, the Bible says, are without repentance. What does that mean? That means when he gives you a special call, he never takes it away. Now, you may or may not fulfill it. You do have choice in the matter, but he won't take that call away. And if you don't, follow it, you're not going to be as happy and you're not going to be as successful as he wants you to be. It's eternal. God's gift to a mother, a mother's gift to God, and our gift to God is our outline for today. God's gift to a mother, 1 Samuel 1 and 2. The family of Elkanah, and they got some strange names back then for us who speak English, uh, Elkanah was one husband, but he had two wives. Well, that was trouble to start with right there and led to dismay in the home at times. One wife was Hannah, and she had no children, but he was her favorite. The other wife was Penaniah, and she had many children. She did have the children. One man with two wives to keep happy to love, to take care of, to do all the things necessary to have a happy and peaceful home. And it not always was pleasant, though, as you can guess. And this home was a saved and godly worshiping home. We would have called them Christian today, but they didn't have Christians back then because Jesus the Christ had not come yet, and they were still looking forward to the time that he would come. But they still had trouble. Seems some trouble just follows every home sometime, doesn't it? No matter how hard we try, and even after we're saved, we still have some troubles to deal with. Now for the story. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel. If you've got a Bible in front of you, you might want to do that and follow along. <clears throat> Now there was a certain man of Ramathan, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerahim, 
the son of Elihu, and the son of Tohu, the son of Zop, an Ephraim knight, in other words, the tribe of Ephraim on the east side of the Jordan River. And he had two wives, the name of one Hannah and the name of the other Penaniah. Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up to the city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was in that day. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophniah and Phinehas, and the priest of the Lord were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah, to make an offering, he would give portions to Penaniah, to his wife, and to all of her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was not a pleasant experience at times in that home. And so the one who knew she was less favored reacted to the one who was highly favored, but she would then provoke her by probably something like, nah, 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 you got no children, I got a lot, and that type of thing that we humans sometimes do to each other when we... No, we really shouldn't, but, you know, sometimes we get out of sorts too. And so that probably was quite often, and so it made her very sad. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? And so Hannah arose after they had finished eating, and drinking in Shiloh. They had been to Shiloh because that's where the temple, the tabernacle was, the, the house of God. And they went there yearly as custom to show their love and devotion to the Lord and to bring their sacrifices and to fellowship with the other believers there before going back home. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord and, and Hannah, she was in bitterness of soul and so she prayed to the Lord and she wept in anguish. And then she made a vow and she said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come on his head, which meant she would dedicate him as a Nazarite. A Nazarite was to never cut their hair to show that they were set apart, a very holy person set apart by God, for God, to God, by that vow, and then they would be a servant unto the Lord. And so it happened as she continually prayed before the Lord that Eli watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief I have spoken unto now. Then Eli answered and said, Well, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant you your petition, which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way. She ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they rose early in the morning, and they worshipped before the Lord, and then they returned and came to their home 
to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And so it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and she bore a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. And so his name means heard by God. Now the man Elkanah and all of his house went up to offer to the Lord the yearly sacrifices and his vow. But Hannah did not go up this time for she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned, then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there forever. God's gift, mother's gift, our gift. So uh, Cana, her husband, said to her, Do what seems best to you. Wait until you've weaned him. Only let the Lord establish his word. Then the woman stayed and nursed her son until she had weaned him. He's probably going to be about four or five, maybe six, when she takes him to church the first time. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bulls and one effort of flour and a skin of wine and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh and the child was young. Then they slaughtered the bull and brought the child to Eli. And she said, Oh my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you there praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed and the Lord has granted me my petition which I asked of him and therefore I also have lent him to the Lord as long as he lives. He shall be lent to the Lord. So they worshiped the Lord there. Anna prayed, and this was her sermon in prayer. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. No one is holy like the Lord. For there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk, talk, to more, talk no more to very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth. For the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumble are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even the barren has borne seven. And I think she's referring to herself, by the way. And she who has many children has become feeble. The Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and he makes rich. He brings up and he lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the Lord, for the earth are the pillars of the Lord, and he has set the, word, the world upon them. He will guard the feet of his saints, but the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength no man can prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. And from heaven he will thunder against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and anoint the horns of his anointed. Which referred here is going to be Samuel. Then Elkanah went to his house in Ramoth. But the child remained to the Lord before Eli the priest. Then there's some other things taking place, but now we're going over to the call. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. He's in the, ta he's in the tabernacle, he sleeps in the tabernacle, and he's learning all of the ropes and all of the ways in which you do ministry back then, and, you and what sacrifices are required for various types of uh, omissions and certain types of sacrifices as praises and offerings of, 
of gratitude to the Lord for his goodness and things of that sort. And he's learning all of these things. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. So the times were difficult. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place in his bed, when his eyes had begun to grow dim, he was losing his sight, then he could not see. Before the lamp of the Lord went out in the tabernacle of the Lord where the ark of God was and where Samuel was laying down, that the Lord called Samuel and he said, and he answered, that is Samuel answered, here am I. So he ran to Eli, here I am, for you called me. And he said, I did not call, lie down again. And so he went and he laid down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. Samuel rose and he went to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. And he answered, I did not call you my son, lie down again. I think he's getting a little bit irritated, don't you? Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and so he arose. He went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived. About time, huh? Like me, sometime hard-headed. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy, and therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And so Samuel went. He laid down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood, And called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak, for your servant hears. And then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears and everyone who hear of it will tingle. In the day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end, for I told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons did themselves vile and he did not restrain them. And therefore I've sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel lay down until the morning and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. And then he called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He answered, here I am. And he said, what is the word that the Lord spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all the things that he said to you. So then Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And, he, and then he said, this is Eli talking now, it is the Lord, let him do what seems good to him. So Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. Then the Lord appeared again to, in Shiloh for the word revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Let's read that again. Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh after all that time that it was rare. For the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And this is sort of a play on words because who is the word? 
the coming Messiah. And so the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Hannah made a vow in verse 11 to God. And she is just, unjustly provoked and she's accused by the other wife. But Hannah being a kind and, and godly woman, a woman of faith, a woman mighty in prayer. Oh, what an example for women everywhere. Hannah gives her precious little boy to God and to the house of God to be trained to be God's chosen servant, the founder of the school of the prophets. And little Samuel became known to all the world as Samuel the prophet and wrote two of the books of the Old Covenant, First and Second Samuel, which is a history that parallels greatly with First and Second Kings and also with Chronicles. So you learn a lot about Israel of those days because Hannah believed and received from God that which she sought in prayer. You know, I said to you, our gift to God is ourselves. God's gift to the mother was a little boy that God had already planned for and laid out the plan before the foundation of the world. But the mother's gift was to God of her little boy. But the third part of this outline today is our gift to God. Have we given ourselves fully and truly to God? I mean, have we really sat down and thought about it and said, Lord, you know, I have held back some things uh, or I have, I'm dealing with something, and I, I really can't get over it by myself. I really need your help. I, I, I need to have a renewal with you. It was so wonderful when you first saved me, but I kind of drifted, and, and it's, it's, it's dull of my memory now. Lord, I need you. That's our gift to God is ourself. Yes, we give our tithes. And, and, and we, we do good works and things like that, but that's secondary. The important thing that God really wants is our heart. Our heart, our mind, our soul, any way you want to say it. He wants us to be like Samuel, dedicated to him. Holy, completely. Now, I did not know, I didn't know him as Savior. Uh, in my teens, I thought I was okay. I went to Sunday school. Sometimes even stayed for church when I didn't have to. But Sunday school was kind of important to me because I got with the rest of the guys and the girls, you know, and then we did all kind of things together sometimes, things we probably didn't want our parents to know about doing together, you know. So, But it, it was my life. But I didn't know I didn't know him as Savior for I knew so much about Jesus. And I believed he was the Savior. I really believed that. But at 21, I came to know him not as the Savior, not as the Savior. I came to know him as my Savior. Wow, what a difference. What a difference. The whole world opened up like it had never been before. And I, I got so hungry and I couldn't wait for church doors to open. And I was there. I was there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, any other night they'd have anything going. I had to be there because I was like a sponge. And, and it was great. Yes, it changed my life. And, it's, and it changes our life many times in life. It's not a one-time thing. I mean, yes, we're saved and... He takes our sins away and that's done away forever and he buries it into the deepest part of the sea of forgetfulness to never bring it up again. But we have many renewals in life or we ought to be having many renewals in our life. And, and I told you about my Youth for Christ thing the, the other time and, and so we won't go into those details now, but I made a big difference in my life 
when I really surrendered my total will to whatever God willed for me from then on. And after that is when I received the call. Now, I used to say as a little boy, I'm going to be a preacher like my granddaddy. I'm going to be a preacher like my granddaddy. And people thought it was cute. And I probably thought it was cute, and so I said it more. But I didn't really understand what all that really meant. And you never really can really understand until you make Jesus your personal Savior, your Savior, not the Savior. He is that, and he's that forever. But when you make it your experience, it makes all the difference in the world. So I needed to make it personal, and I had to surrender to God's Son as Savior. And so to complete God's gift to a mother, a son, and a mother's gift to God, her son, my gift to God was myself. It's a daily renewal, a daily prayer as we follow Jesus everywhere. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we thank you so much for the faithfulness of Samuel and for that mother. Oh, what, what an example. Lord, I know we, we all, we look to Hannah and we look to many of the mothers of the Bible. We think about Deborah as, as she had to chide Balak, the man who was too weak and willy-washy. And so she, she led them to battle. He said, I won't go unless you go with me. And so she became actually more like the queen of Israel rather than a judge. And so we see so many times women of the Bible are examples to all of us, men, women, boys, and girls. But Lord, today you are the example, and you're our example, and you're our Savior. I just want to thank you again for saving us, for loving us in spite of us, and there's times, Lord, when we really do get out of sorts and you have to take us to that proverbial woodshed and wail the daylight out of us until we straighten up and fly right. But you never let us go once you have received us. And we just praise you for that. So, Lord, look in our hearts today and let this be a time, this Mother's Day, a renewal of ourselves to you as well. And we just thank you. Let your love spread throughout this nation and bring renewal to the nation, Lord. For we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Today we're closing song going to be Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. So let us stand together and sing. While we're singing this, if you need to make any uh, prayers to the Lord about anything, this would be a very good time to do that. A fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. A blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from
Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together today again. And go with us through this coming week in whatever ways in which we go, wherever we be. Lord, always be with me and with each and every one gathered here today. And so lead and guide us and bring us again rejoicing in your victories as we gather as the family of God again until time for the trumpet to sound and the dead in Christ to rise first and we who are alive and remain caught up with you into the clouds to meet you in the air. Until then, Lord, thank you. Watch over us. Bless us. And congregation, go in the peace of Jesus and in his victory. Amen. Amen.